period on the periodic table. How many elements are in that first row if you kind of ignore hydrogen being in two spots at once? How many elements do we have there? Well, we have hydrogen and we have helium. There are two elements in the first row on the periodic table. How many elements are in the second row? So if you started at lithium and then you cruise on across to neon, how many elements are in that row? Well, what do you know, Mr. Borden? There's eight there. Is it a coincidence that the first shell of an electron holds two electrons and the first row on the periodic table has two elements in it? Is it a coincidence that the second row on the periodic table has eight elements in it and that shell holds eight electrons? Is it a coincidence that the third row on the periodic table also has eight elements in it and that shell holds eight electrons? No, these aren't coincidences. This is how the periodic table is arranged. We've arranged it in terms of atomic number. We put a big gap there because there's these elements down below, but the first shell holds two, the second shell holds eight, the third shell holds eight, and you can continue that down. Um, the next shell holds, uh, if we count it all the way across from potassium uh, to krypton, we'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, oh, nine, 10, 11, 12, uh, 18. So for those of you who are saying, how many elements or electrons are in the next one? Yeah, it's 18. So we have uh, 288, 18, 18, 36, 36, if I'm not mistaken, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 32 and 32 in the last two shells. Um, in grade 11, you'll talk about the, the next um, elements past 19, or 18, sorry. So we talk about um, S, S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals, and F orbitals. And uh, that's all for chemistry 11. So don't worry about it. But for science 10, we've got the first 18, long as you can remember 288. Eight. And if you can't, just remember that the first row has two, the next row has eight, the next row has eight, then you're good to go with the shells. Um, now I apologize, we're kind of bouncing around a little bit in the notes right now. Uh, so multiplies by four every second one. Is that the case? Two, four, 18. Uh, 32 is the, the last two. I miscounted, I think, not 36. So that rule doesn't necessarily apply. All right, so if you can kind of go back a little bit in the notes, it starts talking about ions. Um, near the Bohr model stuff. I forget uh, exactly what page this is on. But we're going to talk about ions now. This is where everything kind of turns into science 10 from science 9. In science 9, you talked about protons, neutrons, atomic mass, atomic number. All of that stuff is things you should have covered in grade 9. Now we're going to talk about stuff that is unique to science 10. We talk about ions. Now the trickiest part one of the tricky parts about chemistry is some questions you'll see say an atom of chlorine and then some questions you'll see say an ion of chlorine and you need to in your brain draw a distinction between atoms and ions they are different things but they refer to the same elements so things get tricky in that regard so atoms they exist in nature but they aren't happy and when an atom becomes an ion it just is trying to become happy. That's all it wants in life is just to be happy. So sometimes atoms will lose or gain electrons to make their shell, their outer shell, which we call a valence shell. The last shell in a Bohr model is called a valence shell. Sometimes they're gonna gain or lose electrons to have a full outer shell to become happy. Now you're saying, Mr. Borden, how do I know if they're gaining or losing? Uh, if you wanna think about it this way, atoms are really lazy. They're always gonna do the easiest thing. So above me here, I have uh, atomic number or protons of 11. So this is, if I look on my periodic table, 11 is sodium. So this is sodium, this is a Bohr model of sodium. There's 11 protons, there's 12 neutrons, and how many dots do I have? Well, if there's 11 protons, there's 11, uh, 11 electrons. So we have two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, and then we have this one kind of 
hanging out by itself out here in the third shell. Now, if you are sodium, what is going to be easier for you to have a full outer shell? Are you going to try to search and try to find an additional seven electrons to fill that outer shell? Or are you just going to say, hey, I could probably just get rid of this one and then have a full outer shell? So is it more likely that sodium is going to gain seven electrons or lose one? What seems like a simpler thing for this, this little sodium to do? That's good. If you've seen this in Science 9, then uh, you're further ahead, which is awesome. Yeah, it's going to be easier to just lose one. So if you're sodium and you lose one, what do you look like now? Well, you look like this. Um, you have these, uh, you have the 11 protons still. You still have 12 neutrons, but now your number of electrons isn't the same as your number of protons. You lost that one. So that outer shell that was out here with that one electron flying around the outside, you got rid of it. And you're saying, well, where did it go? Well, there was another atom around somewhere that was like, hey, I'd really love to take that electron from you. So it gave it up to somebody else, which is fine. This happens all the time. Remember, we're talking about like trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of electrons interacting. So this just happens. There's always somebody nearby who's willing to give up an electron or take an electron. So that's how it works. So this is kind of the, the tricky part that maybe might not make a ton of sense in your brain. Now, the uh, sodium down right next to me here, right there, um, it now doesn't have the same number of protons as it does uh, electrons. So the protons are 11, but now the electrons are only 10. So this atom is no longer an atom. It has lost an electron, and it is now an ion. It has a charge. So if you have 11 positive charges, 11 protons in the middle, and around the outside you only have 10 negative charges. So overall, what is the total charge on this ion? You have 11 positives in the middle, you have 10 negatives on the outside. There's an imbalance between positives and negatives. Avery, I see your question, I'll get to it in just one second. So what is the charge on this uh, sodium going to be? If you have 11 positives in the middle, you have 10 negatives on the outside, you end up with a charge of positive one. You have one extra proton. So there's some really great questions coming in here. I should probably throw them up on the board. Uh, Avery, you're right. It has a charge of plus one. There are 11 positive charges. There are only 10 negative charges. So you have an imbalance. You have one extra proton, which is fine. Uh, so Alex, you asked a great question. Since atomic number, or yeah, since atomic number equals number of protons, then doesn't the atomic number change too? Well, if you look up above here, we have 11 protons. And down here, we have 11 protons. So the number of protons did not change. If it had changed, you would be completely right, Alex. You would change the element. The atomic number would change. But we haven't changed the number of protons. It stayed the exact same. It stayed as 11. The only thing we're changing is the electrons. Now, if you think about the kind of picture of an atom, you have all these things in the middle, the nucleus, the protons and neutrons, the electrons are buzzing around the outside. The electrons are kind of flying around out there, and they're easily lost and gained because they're out on the outside. In the middle, in the nucleus, these things are kind of packed tightly in there. They're protected by all the electrons. You don't generally lose or gain protons or neutrons. It can happen, but not very often. So the number of protons and number of neutrons very rarely ever changes. There's a few exceptions, which we'll talk about at the very end of the chemistry unit. But generally speaking, the nucleus remains unchanged. For everything we're going to do for the next two weeks, um, the nucleus will always remain the same. So the idea here is that, um, that was Alex's question, and then Avery, why do they do that? Um, elements want to have a full outer shell. If we look at the periodic table, the, jump back here to a picture of it, the last column has this helium down through 
Um, and these are called the noble gases. And the noble gases are extremely stable. They don't bond with anything because their outer shells are full. So when we talk about atoms bonding with other things, the reactivity of an atom is determined by what's going on in the outer shell. So if you have a full outer shell, you become very stable. And all atoms want to have a full outer shell, whether that means filling it with extra electrons or getting rid of extra electrons in that outer shell. So everything's trying to look like its nearest noble gas. Sometimes it'll gain electrons to look like that. Sometimes it'll lose electrons to look like that. But these noble gases are stable and all atoms want to become stable. So it's kind of the idea behind this gaining and losing of electrons is to become more stable. So they gain or lose to become the most stable they can. And that means looking like their closest noble gas. So I think we got most of those questions. Uh, if we added one proton to an atom, would we have just created a new element? Yes, you have. Exactly. So if you started here at, I don't know, go back to that other periodic table. If you're at sodium and you could figure out a way to throw a proton in the middle of sodium, um, you would end up with uh, magnesium. You'd go from 11 to 12. And then if you had some magnesium and you said, oh, okay, I'm going to throw this one proton in the middle, you would go from 12 to 13. All of a sudden it becomes aluminum. Now, for hundreds of years, scientists tried to do this. They tried to create gold out of everything you could imagine. Um, it was based on, they called it alchemy. And they were trying to make gold. It was a precious metal. They said, well, if we started with whatever, like the things they started with was just amazing. They started with things like he, uh, human urine, um, elements that existed in nature, other things. They tried, they tried desperately to get these things to turn into gold. And they were um, very unsuccessful because it's very difficult to do this. Now, we talk about radioactivity later, which allows us to do this. Uh, but in nature, it doesn't naturally sort of happen. There's no atoms just spontaneously changing into other atoms because of something we do. They happen as a result of radioactivity. Uh, Alex saying helium doesn't react. No, it doesn't. Uh, helium doesn't react. And one really cool thing about helium is that because it doesn't react and it's not bonded with anything, helium won't react or form bonds with anything because it's really happy. It has a full outer shell. It has two two spots in its outer shell, two electrons, it's full, it's happy. Uh, the amount of helium on Earth is finite, meaning it's not unlimited. And if you can imagine helium, it's really, really uh, light. It, that's why we fill balloons with helium. It floats up into the atmosphere. So if you had a helium balloon, you popped it, the helium will escape out of that balloon and it'll float up into the atmosphere. Eventually, on Earth, we're going to run out of helium. And you're like, what? Yeah, it's happening. There will be a helium shortage. I don't know if it'll happen in your lifetime or my lifetime, but helium, because it is so light, it travels up into the atmosphere and it just disappears and it just goes away and we're going to run out of helium because it just floats away. Um, pretty crazy. It's going to happen eventually. Um, it's kind of sad. I like helium balloons. And we could fill it with things like hydrogen, but hydrogen's um, highly flammable and can explode. So that's not a good idea either. What if we're wrong and helium is heavy, but it's just repelled by gravity instead of attracted to it? That's an interesting theory. I'm sure it can be disproved many, many ways. What will happen when all of the helium's gone? I don't know. We won't have helium balloons at birthday parties anymore. Be a sad day, wouldn't it? Um, the only thing kind of lighter than helium is hydrogen and it's flammable. I mean, maybe in like a few thousand years, people won't have balloons at birthday parties anymore. That's sad. Sad to think about it. All right. Um, this isn't again in your notes, but it, it's important enough to um, figure it out. So let's talk about ions a little bit more. And we'll draw a few ions here in a second. So the example behind me is fluorine. Fluorine's atomic number nine on the periodic table. It has a mass of 19. So if we go 19 minus nine, we end up with 10 neutrons. So that's in the, the nucleus there. If it has nine protons, it has nine electrons. So we draw the dots. Two in the first shell, one, two, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Now, if I'm fluorine, my outer shell is the one I'm concerned about. My outer shell has seven electrons in it. Now, is it going to be easier for fluorine to get rid of all seven of those electrons or for fluorine to gain one electron? What do we think? Get rid of seven or gain one? What is easier for fluorine to do? Now, asking the next question beyond that is, if fluorine decides to get rid of a bunch or gain uh, one, what is the new charge it's going to have? So, you guys are right. Um, fluorine's going to gain one electron to fill its outer shell because it only needs one to have that full eight. So if it gains one, it's going to look like this. You can see that the new electron is this little blue dot here. Now, before it had nine protons and nine electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but it gained an electron. So now it has nine protons and 10 electrons. So because it gained a negative charge, it gained an electron, this fluorine will now have an overall charge of minus one. So that is an ion. So on, on the right here, or left, I suppose, uh, this is a fluorine atom. It has nine protons, it has nine electrons. On the other side, we have a fluorine ion. It has nine protons and it has 10 electrons. So an atom, in an atom, the number of protons and electrons is the same. That's what we call an atom. When we talk about an ion, it has a charge. The protons and electrons aren't the same. You either have extra electrons or you either have extra protons. So fluorine will always gain an electron and will always have an overall charge of minus one just because that's the easiest darn thing for fluorine to do. And now that fluorine's gained that electron, it looks like uh, neon, because they are the, the same thing. Um, they have the same outer shell. So it's trying to look like it's closest noble gas, which is neon. All right, uh, let's look at a few more ions, and then we'll look at uh, wrapping up for the day. So let's do a couple more examples. I'm just gonna jump back over to my notebook here. All right, let's talk about some ions. Lost my pen, found my pen. Uh, I'm gonna pick something like, let's start with something easy. Let's look at lithium. Uh, lithium is element number three on the periodic table. All right, so atomic number is three, and its uh, atomic mass is 6.9. 6.9, and we're gonna round that to seven, because it's close to seven, we'll call it seven. All right, uh, in the middle there are three protons, and then the mass of the, the nucleus is seven. So three of those seven are protons. What's left? Well, if we go seven minus three, we end up with four, and that's the number of neutrons. So what I'm gonna do is draw a lithium atom. So lithium is Li. Here's my atom. And I'm gonna draw a lithium ion. All right, so in the nucleus, I have three protons and four neutrons. For both an atom and an ion, that is the exact same. So the nucleus for atoms and ions are identical. If we change the number of protons, it would just become a new element. So that wouldn't work very well. So for an atom, I have three protons. I'm gonna also have three electrons. So we know the first shell can hold two, one, two. I need three, so I'm going to add one more. There we go, three. Now, if I'm lithium, am I going to gain to fill up my outer shell? Remember that, that outer shell, the valent shell for lithium there can hold eight. So is it going to gain seven? 
or lose one. What's going to be easiest for it? Think of it as just being really lazy. It's going to lose one, for sure. It's going to lose one, yeah. Of course it's going to lose one. All right, so I'm going to draw it again over here. Sorry, need a new shell. All right. All right, so in the inside here, I had one, two, and then the next shell. I had that third one. But you guys all said, hey, Mr. Borden, it's going to lose one. So we're going to get rid of it. Gone. Now that other shell is empty, so I can just get rid of that as well. There we go. So now that lithium has lost one electron, decided to get rid of it, it has three protons. And it has only two electrons. So is the charge unbalanced? Yes, that's why we call it an ion. What is the unbalanced charge? What do I have extra of? Do I have extra protons or do I have extra electrons? Is this thing going to have an overall charge of positive or is this going to have an overall charge uh, being negative? Well, if I have three protons, that's three positive charges. One, two, three. And I only have two negative charges. Of course, not drawn to scale. What am I going to be left with? Well, one positive cancels out with a negative. Another positive cancels out with a negative. And I'm left with one extra positive charge. So when I draw my ions, so far we haven't done this, but this is a good habit to get into. What we do is we put these giant brackets around it. Giant brackets. And up here in the top corner, we write the overall charge that this thing has. So we are saying that this thing has a charge of plus one because it has one extra proton. Because it lost a negative charge, it now has an overall positive one charge. So this is what the ion is going to look like. We're going to draw our ions like this. Big square brackets, positive charges next to it or negative as the case may be. So we'll look at some other examples of ions uh, next day. Look at some more. So for now, we're going to leave it like that. I'm going to jump into the learning guide and kind of show you um, what I'd like you guys to do for next day's work. Uh, just kind of some stuff to Get your, uh, get your Bohr models on and remember doing some of these things um, if you've remembered them from last year. So the learning guide looks like this. Uh, so we've done some of these notes. We've done some of the atomic theory bonding stuff. We did the nucleus. We did the periodic table. And then you guys talked about ions a little bit. So we've just kind of touched on ions. We haven't really done a, a ton of that stuff yet. We didn't get to patterns in the periodic table, so we're just going to leave the notes uh, at that spot for now. But down at the bottom, there's some practice questions. All right, so this is on page, page eight. And on page eight, it says uh, practice atomic theory and bonding. So you should be able to do the first uh, three questions. And then five, six, yep, yep. Should be good for there. And you're good up to eight and nine. So question nine, it's talking about atoms. Now, hopefully I haven't confused the idea of atoms and ions, but it wants you to draw the Bohr model for boron. It wants you to draw the Bohr model for aluminum. I think there are a few extras on the next page as well. Uh, so boron, neutron, boron, aluminum, nitrogen, phosphorus on page 10. Um, number 10, you won't be able to answer right now. So skip for now. And then number 11 asks you to draw some ions. So 
This is number 11 on page 11. You should be able to complete up to the bottom of page 11. So that's where we're going to leave you for now. Um, yeah, Abby, we, I, have, I have to teach class at KSS uh, in a few minutes here, so I'm going to jump over to my other role. So the schedule is a bit wonky in terms of what's going on. Uh, you won't have any more class today. That's it for today. It was scheduled for me to be two hours and a half long, but we won't have that uh, because... Everybody else is teaching and I have to teach a KSS. Tomorrow, it says two hours of social studies or two and a half hours of social studies. What we're going to do is first thing in the morning is going to be uh, social studies. And then at 1030, I'm going to jump in for an hour and we'll continue on with where we've left off today. Now, I have been really lenient so far with you guys getting work done on time. And I've been harping on you to get the first three units done and to get unit 10 done. Some of you have, some of you haven't. When we get into this chemistry stuff, if you do not keep up with us, you will get left behind very quickly. We're going to move quickly through it because we just have no choice. We don't see each other that often, twice a week. So I'm going to have to motor through this stuff. But if you're not keeping up, if you're not doing the little tiny bits of work each day, if you just sit down and try to do it all at the end of the week, you will be absolutely lost. And I don't want that to happen. Chemistry is kind of like math. It's scaffolded. If you don't get the foundation stuff, the things we're going to do tomorrow is just going to be way beyond you. And the things we're going to do the next day is going to be even more difficult. And then once we get to the very end, if you don't understand how to do the stuff at the very beginning, the very end is going to be like an absolute different language. So I can't stress it enough. At the end of each of these classes, when I say go through and draw the Bohr models, do the work, please do it. You have to. If you don't, this chemistry stuff is going to leave you in the dust. So I wanted you guys to all have a fresh start in chemistry. And uh, hopefully you've done all the old stuff, the biology and things like that. But if not, get it done and keep up with the chemistry. If you get behind in the chemistry, it's just that's the end of the story. You'll be, you'll be toast. And it's such a big part of the, the class. So... Uh, I'm going to leave it there. I want you guys to do these practice problems. You were expecting class for two and a half hours today. I only was on for an hour and a bit. So you have plenty of time to do these few pages of practice. Please do them. If you have questions, come back with them next day, tomorrow. And um, yeah, essentially everything's kind of like grade nine. There's nothing really different than what you did in grade nine. Some of you may have talked about ions in grade nine. Some of you maybe not. Um, we're going to continue on with ions, bonding, Lewis dot diagrams next day. So that's where we're at. I have to run. Uh, get that stuff done. If you have questions, let me know. And uh, hopefully you don't. Hopefully you remember it from grade nine. But do them. Actually do them. If you aren't doing these things, you will not understand them. I guarantee you that. So have a great afternoon. Enjoy the sunshine out there once you're done your science. And uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks.